Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Hurts the value and hurts your reputation. Uh, doesn't do you any good. And as soon as he received his visa, his mood changed a little. Hi there, I'm Tom Natchu. Welcome to another edition of Fraud Squad TV. You know, fraud isn't something that just impacts a few so-called gullible people. It's not a nickel and dime kind of crime. It's a multi-billion dollar criminal industry and it's growing every day. The individuals that concoct these schemes to take your money won't stop at any given limit and they have no conscience whatsoever about taking a vulnerable victim's life savings. Our investigations are clear about that time and time again. So let's start to protect our families, our friends and ourselves. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. It's one of the oldest crimes in the world. Forging the work of artists has always been a popular scam among fraudsters, but these days, advances in technology and with the help of international media, selling forgeries has never been more widely practiced, with over 120,000 convictions in America just last year. In this story, a television show broadcast in the Los Angeles area sold $20 million worth of fake art to more than 10,000 victims over two years. We believe that there are over 10,000 victims um, in this fraud scheme. The television show was called Fine Art Treasures. It was broadcast across America on DirecTV satellite network. Now they were selling fake art by such masters as Rembrandt, Picasso and Monet in a live auction format. Christine Eubanks and Gerald Sullivan seem to have a good thing going. Part of the reason the the fraud scheme was so successful is that it was on live television. It it aired on TV on Friday and Saturday nights. It aired all over the United States um, in all different uh, cities across the country and also aired on live streaming internet. So actually it went worldwide. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Fine Art Treasures Live Art Gallery. When people watch a show and are buying products, in this particular case, art uh, from a live TV show, the fact that it's on TV gives it some sense of legitimacy. So I think people felt uh, it was a safe purchase because if it was fake, uh, they wouldn't be on the air. Some personal folks, it is stunning. I've got $100, thank you, let's get a clock on it. Um, initially, I saw the complaints and I kind of put, it in a, put them in a file, kind of made a note of it. The amounts of money that, that, that were being lost during these, these complaints didn't really rise to the level of, of an investigation that, that I would start. Um, uh, over time, I started receiving more and more complaints, which set off a kind of a red flag with me because people normally don't call the FBI when there's a crime. As a result of the large number of complaints, the FBI launched an investigation jointly with the Los Angeles Police Department, the Internal Revenue Service, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. In order to catch these scumbags, a covert operation was launched where the FBI agents posed as buyers calling into the show to acquire the fake art. This is what the, what the prints that, that were being sold on the television show look like when they're taken out of the fancy frame. As you look at it, it's just basically, uh, it's almost like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper uh, with a photomechanical um, image of a uh, actual Picasso image. Um, this is a piece actually that the FBI purchased um, during the investigation and uh, we paid approximately $5,000 for this piece of art. They had got you both coming and going. They did the art auction in which they actually auctioned off the fake artwork, but they did so by rigging that auction process in and of itself. We have 225, we have $240. Clock, please, 250. 
They would have fake calls and fake bids that they would use to run up the price of their fake art that they would sell. And the second part of that was, you know, completely selling, moreover than not, false and fraudulent artwork to their customers. Um, and so when I say coming and going, they actually made to pay more for the fake art by running up the price through those fake bids. Get the detail in this. It's just great. And you know what's fabulous about these pieces is because he was a war correspondent, you know, during this time, he saw these actual events firsthand. This is first they told their victims that the art that they were purchasing was worth anywhere up to $80,000, $90,000. They would tell them, this is for your grandchildren's college. And often when they were using their propped fake art, they would say, this isn't a deal. This is a steal. And in fact, it was, as it turned out. I think people want to believe um, that they're getting good deals. They, they want to believe that, uh, that may, maybe they can, you know, you know, maybe they have the opportunity to buy this great piece of art way, way under value. And, and I think uh, uh, the TV show and the people who are running it really took advantage of people and people's sense of, of wanting to believe uh, in something that was you know, too good to be true. Local artist Charlene Mitchell became a different kind of victim in this fraud when she brought her work into their print shop for reproduction. Asking for only 100 copies, she had no idea that Christine and Gerald were planning to make many, many more. I first discovered I was defrauded when a man approached me to buy my artwork because he said he had bought some from a source I had never heard of and wished to purchase more. The main thing, I think, is in this kind of day and age um, and in this global economy, the, the fraud schemes that have been thought up by criminals around the world have become more and more sophisticated. The quality of much of her work was very poor. The, she used the cheapest ink she could to print these G. Clays, and after a while, the print might look okay when you first get it, but after a while, the colors change, and it's hideous. After they completed Charlene's original order, the printers began to make even more copies each one bearing the artist's forged signature and a bogus limited edition number. Thousands of forgeries began appearing on cruise lines and in hotels across the continent. She signed the pieces and she collected. Yeah, one of the things that they did um, was have fake certificates of authenticity that they had either purchased through another supplier or simply printed up themselves. Hurts the value, it hurts your reputation. Uh, doesn't do you any good. You know, you can barely get a piece framed for 360, let alone triple matted and a Marc Chagall piece. Thanks to the FBI's joint investigation, they were stopped. And Christine Eubanks and her husband Gerald Sullivan pled guilty and then were sentenced to six years in prison. But that's just the beginning. Multiple charges are being made from other victims while they serve that time. And it's expected that they'll stay in jail a lot longer than six years. Everyone thinks they can get away with it at some point. Um, and what ends up getting you in the end, what ends up getting these crooks in the end, is their greed. Um, the greed takes over. Um, the amount of money they're making uh, is, is so great that they can't stop. We're here once again with Craig Hannaford to ask some follow-up questions. This is something I'm really interested in, collecting art now that I'm old. So how can I ensure that the art is real? Can I? ask the seller to authenticate the work before I actually purchase it? Well, that, that's a good, uh, good first step. I mean, the art dealer should be able to provide you with a history of that particular piece of art. Who was the previous owner? Where did it come from? When did the artist uh, paint it? All that type of history should be available for you to inspect. Here's a semi-rhetorical question. Is it safe to assume that I probably shouldn't be buying great works of art from a home shopping program? Well, well I think that is pretty uh, safe to assume. I don't think you're going to find any Da Vinci's uh, on the uh, uh, on a shopping channel. But uh, nevertheless, you may be able to find some good popular art deals on a shopping channel. So, you know, you still have to be cautious. All right, I buy the piece of art, I get it home, I hang it on the wall, I start to get that empty feeling that maybe it's a phony. What do I do then? Well, I think the first thing you should do is try and return it to the place where you uh, bought it. But as in this piece, the whole operation was a criminal uh, operation. You may be out of luck, and that's when you're going to have to go to your local police authorities and report that you've been the victim of an art fraud. If you're thinking about buying some art, then maybe you should hang on just a minute. Craig's got a few more tips about how to avoid art fraud.
Marriage is usually one of the happiest times in a person's life, but not for the victims of marriage fraud. Some people are using the institution of marriage and the legal benefits therein as a means of gaining citizenship to a foreign country. Now, in many cases, the newly landed newlywed vanishes as soon as they arrive in their new country. And on top of that, they begin racking up government financial benefits with no intention of ever working or paying back the government loans. And in all of these cases, the victimized spouse is financially responsible. Now, we've seen fraud take advantage of the lonely and the elderly, but now, in this case, the emotionally vulnerable. They shouldn't have picked me. And I'm not going to let go of it. Less than 24 hours later, she left. The sweetheart swindlers are still in North America. They're perpetrators of marriage fraud, and their numbers are growing daily. The marriage fraud is very common, especially nowadays. It's becoming a fashion. They just want the easy uh, passport, we can say, to come to Canada. Otherwise, if they come the other way, they have to pay the money, they have to apply for that. It takes a long time to come to Canada as a landed immigrant. It's not only Indian communities anymore. It's not only a Pakistani communities anymore. It's happening all over the world. Worldwide, wannabe North American citizens are seeking out their victims right now. Some of them even using family and family get-togethers to make their mark. I met uh, the woman who I married and sponsored to Canada um, about 1999 uh, when I attended a friend's wedding. She lived in Cuba. I did like her from the first time that I have seen her. I went to Pakistan in spring of 2003, around April, and we went for my brother's wedding, and I met him face to face. And my aunt was there, my mom was there, his sisters were there, my cousins were in the house. The courtship con continues. For months, even years, long distance love is in the air. I dated him a couple of times to know him better. Um, it, he was just wonderful funny, he was um, charming, he was respectful, mm, just the kind of guy you would actually would love to marry. She always uh, kept a uh, positive attitude, she uh, always um, presented herself uh, to be a funny, um, warm person, uh, expressed uh, my feelings to her, and she um, uh, basically uh, told me the same thing, okay, uh, the same uh, feelings uh, that I had for her, she had for me. Founded upon a litany of lies, the marriages happened in Pakistan and Cuba. The cracks began to show before the ceremonies ended. We went to the, the marriage office uh, in, uh, in Cuba. There was laughs, okay. Um, at that time, not being married before, okay, I thought maybe these are laughs of joys and stuff. But uh, now I'm really looking back, they were laughing basically at me. Even if the scam wasn't apparent at the wedding, the marriage fraud became painfully obvious even to the most smitten. The signs had been there all along. As soon as he received his visa, his mood changed a little. It was a totally different person. But he was back home, he, everything I did was perfect. The way I dressed was perfect, the way I put up my hair I was perfect. Uh, the way I met him was perfect, the way we did th things together was perfect, but not over here. Everything I did was wrong. Her uh, attitude was completely changed. There was absolute no excitement uh, on her face, uh, and she, she was very, very cold. I was still thinking that this, all this new behavior is because she's new here and she needs to adjust. Stuff came out of his mouth that I thought, why he's telling me this now? You know, why didn't he say something in Pakistan? Uh, such as, he likes um, tall women. I'm not tall enough for him. Uh, white skin, you know, I'm dark, too dark for him. And um, I'm too skinny. And it's not just the victim's heart that's broken. So is their bank account. Each sponsor is responsible for their new spouse's expenses in Canada. The undertaking is a, is a serious legal 
contract between the sponsor and the government of Canada. The sponsor uh, acknowledges that they are going to be fully responsible to support the person they're sponsoring, the spouse, uh, financially and uh, to offer them uh, what the basic necessities of life and, and sustain them in Canada. When I married her, I had to sign a, a form um, sponsoring her um, f for fin uh, financially. Uh, and uh, this is for a period of three years. Uh, I am responsible uh, for her if she uh, goes and uses any type of um, social services, okay, loans. I am responsible for her not to become a burden to the Canada. It explains to the sponsor the, the seriousness of what they're doing. Uh, they are bringing somebody to Canada, and therefore the, this is a, a serious matter that they have to take, th they should not take lightly. Um, also, it's, it's, a, it's a deterrent from abuse of the system. He was on welfare, I think about September, October again of 2006. Uh, during that time, he collected about $7,300 and uh, I started receiving papers saying, if you don't pay, uh, your case will go to revenue agency. I agreed to pay, and they said $500 a month. I said, my whole paycheck is $500. What do I have to live off? As well, this woman's spouse has applied for and is receiving a disability pension. That kind of shocked me. I called them back. I said, what kind of disability did he apply under? They won't tell me. I said, why are you not telling me? If you're asking me to pay you back, I have to know what disability uh, is prejudice on his part and we're not allowed to tell you his privacy. I did make a question to her, okay, that if she would ever leave me. And the immediate reaction was she ran through she ran towards me, she hugged me, she kisses my face, and she told me what a stupid question that I'm asking she would never leave me. Less than 24 hours later, she left. Marriage fraud victims have had to turn to each other for help. It's not in one community anymore. It's all over the world, and it's from all over the people, like everybody, and, and it's just, people are doing it just to get into Canada. What we are trying to do to, to give support, okay, and use our own knowledge, okay, and experiences, okay, and pass it forward to, to other victims so they can maybe use that. He and his family is not gonna get away with this. I don't have the money for it, that I would say. I don't have the money for it. But I have the willpower, and I will use that to the last drop of my blood and I will seek justice, and I will put him through what he put me through. He will not get away with this. Once again with Craig Hannaford with some follow-up questions. Most frauds require an intellect to avoid. This one is an affair of the heart. If somebody from another country feels like they want to marry you, what precautions can you take? That's what makes this type of uh, fraud so bad, so wicked, because the fraudsters are playing on romance. They're playing on another person's heart. And it's really difficult for a person to identify whether they're being targeted by one of these heartless fraudsters. You know, you hear about prenuptial agreements all the time. Is there some type of a legal agreement I can enter into so that this doesn't happen? Unfortunately, that, that there is no legal agreement that you can enter into because if you sponsor a person like this to come into the country and they divorce you or, uh, you know, take off, you're responsible financially for any social benefits that they draw. So you can be really, really in a bad situation. Everybody wants to believe in love at first sight, and if you are down on a vacation and you strike a, up a romance, that's great. But, you know, take a step back. It takes sometimes a, a long time to develop a relationship, to fall in love with somebody, and you shouldn't be sponsoring somebody into the country just because you've had a great week with them at some resort down south. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Now, let's say it happens to you. What can you do? Well, the best advice I can uh, say is to go to a lawyer, go to an immigration lawyer, and you probably should do that before you contemplate marriage, before you contemplate sponsoring somebody to come into the country. Make sure you have the information so that you're not victimized. He has your attention one more time, doesn't he? Well, stand by. He's got even more tips for you now.
Now Fraud Squad TV takes it to the streets to hear more of your stories. We basically moved to Canada and I brought my husband over and we had hired an immigration consultant to do his paperwork and we ended up paying um, over $5,000 and the paperwork wasn't submitted and which was a basically a delay of eight months and we, we had to hire another immigration lawyer and the paperwork got done after three months and that was it. And the only thing I can say is before you ever deal with any type of immigration consultant, it's better to deal with an immigration lawyer. Um, and you have to do your proper due diligence before you hire anybody who to take on something like this. It's a big issue right now with um, immigration consultants because they're not very, they're not regulated. Um, and they have to be because they're able to basically take advantage of people who don't know the system and who are very vulnerable. Naomi, when you're out there talking to people on behalf of Fraud Squad TV, is there one story that keeps coming up over and over again? Well, there are definitely a few, but one of them is definitely identity fraud. And the really disturbing part about it, Tom, is a number of people who told me that the person who stole their personal information was someone they knew. It's incredible. We've said it many, many times. You can't be too careful about protecting that personal information. You just don't know who might be after it. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of Fraud Squad TV. And for more information, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together.